Is it on? Yes. All right. Good. We're on. Can you hear me in the cars? Honk your horns if you can hear. Okay, that's good. I only heard a couple of you honk, but that's all right. That's, that's all right. Cut me off. Let's sing. That was just a practice. Hey, Tom, can you turn me on? She's not on. It should be on. It's not on. It's not flat. Well, your microphone must not be on. Now it's on. I think the message is Obviously not enough. Okay, let's try this again. You all ready this time? Are we ready this time? It ain't there. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, we got it. Thank you, thank you, we. Thank you. Unpanic. Don't panic. Everything will be fine. Thank you. This is a disaster. Let's 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 sing, shall we? I got an idea.
promise it is. Let's read together. Let all that I am praise the Lord. With my whole heart, I will praise his holy name. Let all that I am praise the Lord. May I never forget the good things he does for me. He has removed our sins as far from us as the east is to the west. The Lord is like a father to his children, tender and compassionate to those who fear him. Praise the Lord. Everything he has created, everything in all his kingdom, let all that I am praise the Lord. Mighty God, we thank you so much for this morning. We thank you for the cool breeze. We thank you for the ability to come to your house. It's so funny that we are outside, but it's still your house. We still worship you. We still listen. Lord, we wake up sometimes with our minds going a mile a minute and and we just ask that during this time that we can calm our minds and we can listen. There's a lot of worry. There's a lot of strife. There's a lot of heartache. But Lord, within all that, there's so much joy. Joy that does not need to be taken away from us. Joy that we need to remember. Joy that we need to celebrate. And that joy comes from you. So Lord, speak to us this morning. We don't take this lightly. Oh, yeah, we like to have a good time, Lord. And I know you smile along with us. But, Lord, we're anxious to hear what you have to tell us today. So whether it's through the music, or whether it's through spoken word, or whether it's just the fellowship that we have with each other, let your presence be here this morning, Lord. And we pray this in your mighty name as always. Amen. Well, take a seat and let me say good morning to you. You out there? Good morning. good morning. I'm getting a couple good mornings. Thank you. Anybody else out there? Ah, well, all right. We'll do the best we can, right? Okay. I understand that after the wedding on Friday evening, an earring was found. I checked with Jay. It's not his. So if you lost an earring on Friday, please talk to Karen Christensen. Uh, she probably has that, or she can let you know where it is. You will have noticed when you came in that there are yard signs around the driveway. They're there for a couple of reasons. Number one, they're there to remind us all to love God and to love our neighbor. They're also there for you to take. Those are the last of the yard signs, and it would make my heart sing if instead of being stuck in that yard, they were stuck in your front yard so that you can tell people that you love God and love your neighbor. I know many of you have taken them, and I'm grateful, and I'm really grateful for whoever came back behind us and straightened them up for me because we put them out there on Thursday morning, and by noon on Thursday, they were half falling over, and Friday morning, some wonderful person, some elf, I suppose, came and straightened them all up for me, and so I'm very grateful for that. Take a sign, put it in your yard. Two other things that I want to mention to you, I don't want to take a lot of time with this, as we um, were put on... Uh, How about that? Okay. This is what we'll do. This is what we'll do. We're good. Don't worry. Uh, as we were told to shelter in place, we were in the process of receiving the America for Christ offering. As you remember, the America for Christ offering goes in its entirety to the American Baptist Home Mission Societies. We did not get to finish taking that offering. So if you would like to contribute to the America for Christ offering, feel free to do that anytime. Just uh, You can do it... Um, Am I back? I'm back. You can do that uh, through PayPal, through online giving with your bank, however you want to do that. Also, the one great hour of sharing. We've missed two special offerings as we have been uh, working around all this COVID business. And that's the one great hour of sharing. That's in partnership with World Church World Services. It's the emergency relief offering. And again, I want to say um, with the denomination, with the American Baptist Churches USA, there's no overhead with these offerings. If you give a dollar, the dollar goes. If you give $100, it goes exactly where you indicate it's to go. So I just want to remind you of those two things, the America for Christ offering and one great hour of sharing. Uh, and if you'd like to share with those, please do so whenever it's convenient for you. Let me invite uh, Jay to come and share with the young folks now. Hi, 
All right, so I have a question. Brought me with me a tin can. And then when I was growing up, we used to play a game with a tin can. What, what did you call it? Do you remember? Who else did it? Kick the can, right? We used to kick the can. What is kick the can, though, really? What 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 game is that? I know you're kicking the can, but what game really does it? Just an added element. What what did you do? Does anybody remember? Hide and seek, right? The goal was to hide and seek. You would sit the can out, and then you would count if you were it, and everybody would go hide. And then you would go find them, and then their goal was to come back and kick the can, right? That has so, got to be the Tennessee version. That's that's the way I played it. Well, that's what I just said. It's the Tennessee well, version. Why did you play it? We just kicked the can. You just kicked the we can. We just kicked the can, yeah. Why are you making it complicated? You guys are weird. Oh, yeah, here. we're I'll weird. Yeah, that okay. Right now. That's Tennessee calling me weird. Yeah, sure. All right. That's well, covered. West Virginia. We won't even yeah, go Yeah, we don't there. even talk about it. <laughs> but anyway. Almost heaven. Remember, it's all right. It's my heaven. turn to talk. You'll get yours in a minute. Okay. So here's, here's the deal. All you on the playground out there, can you hear me? I need your help. I hear a th see a thumbs up. Okay. Here's a question for you. Did people hide from God in the Bible? They, somebody said try. They tried. Who, give me a story of somebody that hid from, from God. Adam. Adam and Eve, right? Right. Soon as they, soon as they took the bite of the, the fruit, what did they do? They felt guilty and ashamed and they heard God walking in the garden and they went and hid behind the trees. But did God find them? Of course. Of course. What's another one? Can you think of another one? Jonah. Jonah. That's perfect. That's exactly where I was going. That's great. Thanks for playing along, Pastor. Um, Jonah is exactly right. Jonah was sent out to tell people to repent from their sins. And what did he do? He went and hid. And did God find him? Where did he find him? Right, in a fish, in a, in a belly of a big fish. Exactly. And then David, David was chosen because David was a man after God's own heart, right? Now, David, I'm sure, did things that did not please God all the time. And I'm sure he wanted to go hide. But here's the deal. He didn't because he knew he couldn't hide from God. We cannot hide from God. See, God knows everything about us. God knew exactly what was going to be said. God knows each hair on our heads. God knows our thoughts. God seeks us because God has blessings for each and every one of us. Blessings that we take for granted sometimes. Blessings that we go right on by. And we don't think about it. But God gives us so much. And sometimes all we have to do is sit still and stop trying to hide. It's so easy when things are bad. It's so easy when things are not going good for us. What do we do? We go and hide when we should be seeking, we should be searching. What do you do if somebody's lost? You go find them, right? That's what God does for us. But when we're scared, and when we're tired, and when we're confused, and when we're frustrated, and we don't know what to do, what's the first thing we tend to do? We tend to go hide. But I'm telling you, God has a plan. And God loves us. God knows your thoughts. So let's not hide. Let's celebrate. Even during this season, even during this time, even during this time that we are struggling, let's celebrate. And we celebrate today. We celebrate also by giving our gifts and our tithes and our offerings. Each week we do this to honor God. We need to listen. And we need to celebrate and also Try our best to listen to what God has planned for us. So we pray for these gifts. We pray for our young people. You know, each week we get to watch. I love it. I love to watch them on the playground. Because they're enjoying themselves. And I think sometimes we need to be just like those young people. We need to sit there and play and appreciate and look at all God's blessings that we have. Let's pray together.
Mighty God, we thank you. We thank you so much for our young people. We thank you for the people that are even confused on what kick the can game is about. We pray for them as well. But Lord, we lift up this time. We lift up our gifts. And we continue to sit still and listen. Listen to what your plan is. But most of all, Lord, we give you thanks and we celebrate. We celebrate and we try our best not to hide. And we try our best to know that even during the dark times that you're walking with us and that we're not alone. And we pray this in your name. I have challenged you in the month of August to spend some time fasting and in prayer. I don't know how that's going for you. I hope that at some point you can find a few moments in the day. I only ask you to do it twice, Monday and Friday. I hope you can find some quiet time during the day to give God some attention. Now, I'm not talking about the prayers that I'm guilty of offering sometimes. God, give me this. God, give me that. God, give me something else. I'm talking about the kind of prayer that spends time reflecting. I'm opening the church sanctuary on Friday morning, starting at 11 o'clock, and giving a couple hours for folk to come in and sit and pray if you want to. A few people have taken advantage of that. It's a nice, quiet place to just sit and reflect on what God has done. During this time that we have the pastoral prayer, we talk about folks that are ill, and to the best of my knowledge, to put it that way, I don't know of anyone that's in the hospital. Sandy Bailey had surgery. She's been discharged. I would like you to uh, remember Linda Gruen and uh, her daughter, when that sent her, they both, uh, when that had some knee surgery, and uh, Linda had a fall last week. They are both at home and they're recovering from those uh, situations, but remember them in your thoughts and prayers. I mentioned to you last week by phone and in person that we had a couple members of the family that tested positive for the coronavirus. We have another family that is waiting for results and they've been told to quarantine. So we will keep you abreast of what's going on in those regards. True whole prayer is nothing but love, said Augustine. So in the spirit of loving God, in the spirit of loving one another, would you join me in prayer? Gracious and loving God, 
In just a moment, we're going to read what you've done for us at just the right time, in your time. In your time frame, you came to make sure that the likes of us could be the children of God. Remember our friends and loved ones who are ill, who've had injuries this week. There have been some difficult things that have happened. Those recovering from surgeries, those in the nursing homes. We ask, Lord God, that you be present with them. Yes, God, you know this is not the situation we envisioned. This is not where we thought we'd be. But you know what? I have to believe, God, that we are supposed to trust in you regardless of the circumstances. Trust in the Lord with all your heart, the writer of Proverbs said, and do not rely on your own insight. In all your ways, acknowledge him, and he will make your paths straight. God, that's, that's all we have right now. That is exactly what we have, are those words from the Old Testament writer that reminds us that we are to trust in you. We've already found that in the last few weeks. We've come up with some ideas, and every time we've come up with an idea, it's been thwarted somehow. Something's gotten in the way of that idea that we were so sure was the right one. And then we hear again, trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not rely on your own insight. In all your ways, acknowledge him. And so that's what we're doing. We're acknowledging you for today. And we are looking forward to what you're going to do tomorrow. And we're going to trust you, God, with all of our hearts and all of our souls, and all of our lives, and all of our beings. And we're going to remember what Paul told the Athenians, that you don't live in a house made with human hands. You live in the hearts of women and men and young people. And there you thrive, and there you grow, and there you challenge. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. And that's what we're going to do each day, one day at a time. Not borrowing from tomorrow, not worrying about yesterday living in this moment in your presence. Hear our prayer, Lord. And God, please, please, God, open hearts, open minds, soften hearts. Let us hear what the Spirit says to the church. Amen. I want to begin this morning with a little bit of background as to what we do when we bring a message. What do you mean, what do you do? Well, I want to remind you of something. We are Baptists. Uh, we're American Baptists specifically, but we're Baptists. Baptists historically believe in the integrity of Scripture. We believe Scripture has purpose and meaning. To Timothy, Paul wrote, all Scripture is inspired by God. Inspired means God breathed. That means God breathed into people, and they wrote what they believed God was telling them to write. All Scripture is inspired by God and useful for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, so that everyone who belongs to God may be proficient, equipped for every good work. So at the outset of my comments today, I want you to know where they're coming from and what I believe in my heart, that when we talk, when we teach, when we preach, whatever, we start with the text because we believe the text is inspired by God. And we pray, we hope, that our interpretation of the text and our exposition of the text is meaningful somewhere along the way. But we start from believing the text. So let me just ask you, and you can show your hands, you can actually, how many of you believe the Bible does, is inspired by God? Anybody believe that besides me? I guess I'm the only one. All right. If that's true, for the two or three of you that responded, then listen to these words from the fifth chapter of Romans. You have it on your worship sheet if you'd like to follow along. It says, for while we were sinners are still weak, at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. Indeed, rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person, someone might actually dare to die. But God proves his love for us, and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Much more surely then, now that we have been justified by his blood, will we be saved through him from the wrath of God. For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, much more surely, having been reconciled, will we be saved by his life. But more than that, we even boast in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. The third R that I've asked you to think about is reconciliation. 
I ask you to think about reflection, which is meditation. I ask you to sit and just actually give God the opportunity to get inside your head. To listen for a voice. I, um, well, okay, we're outside and the whole neighborhood's going to hear it, but you just got to know, hear me. This is Jim. I wake up at 3 o'clock in the morning, and I'm a little afraid. And I'm a little afraid that I will, that I will or have failed. I'm a little afraid of, of what's going to happen out here. And I repeat to myself, trust in the Lord with all your heart. And finally, I drift off. And I wake up 20 minutes later, and I'm still afraid. And I repeat again, trust in the Lord with all your heart. And I wake up a little bit later, and I'm still afraid. But here's where reflection comes in, sisters and brothers. About 6 o'clock this morning, while I admittedly am afraid, I hear, I've got this. That's just what I hear. I don't know what you hear. But I don't hear it without reflection. And I don't hear it without repentance. And I don't hear it without being reconciled to God. There's a whole lot of fancy theological language that comes from Paul's letter to the Romans. But here is the first thing I'd like you to take away. The wonder of Jesus Christ is that he died for us when we are sinners and in a state of hostility to God. Love can't do any better than that. Didn't earn it, didn't achieve it, didn't acquire it somehow by some brilliance of my own. But at the right time, and that is that word kairos, which means at the opportune time, God's time. Not chronos, which is what we do with our watches and our calendars, but kairos, God's time. The absolute right time, God sends Jesus to do one particular thing, and that's to die for us. That Christ died for us is the gospel in four words. That Christ died for us so we can be reconciled to God. That Christ died for us to show us the very heart of God. The very heart of God is an aching open wound of love. The very heart of God is something that wants you and wants me to be reconciled to God. I assure you, as good as you are, as moral and ethical as you may be, you cannot come to God without Jesus. You cannot find that reconciliation that we are looking for. Jesus came to prove unanswerably that God is love. Reconciliation with God, here comes the second point, requires that we learn to live in community with each other. And this is where it gets rough. I can understand the theological concept of justification, that I've been justified, I've been reconciled, I've been sanctified, all those nice theological words. Where it gets ugly is when i got to live that out in community. Because sometimes in community, I don't do very good at it. I, I saw a quote this morning that really uh, resonated with me. I remembered it. I don't know where it came from. I, it's just one of those thing, random things that popped up. It said this. Not every opinion needs to be voiced. Not every emotion needs to be expressed. Listen again. Not every opinion needs to be voiced. Not every emotion needs to be expressed. So I'm pondering that quote, and I'm reminded of what the letter to the Ephesians said. Let no evil talk come out of your mouth, but only what is useful for building up as there is need, so that your words may give grace to those who hear. Those who are reconciled to God through the cross of Jesus Christ are reconciled to one another. I mentioned this before. I mention it again because there's nothing more important to the community of faith than that reconciliation that takes place between believers. Only one petition in the Lord's Prayer has a condition. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. For if you forgive others their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. Now, I want to know what that means. And I'm scared a little bit because I think it means that if I fail to forgive, 
God's not going to forgive me. Which begs the question, if God can't forgive me, am I a child of God? Let me put it even more bluntly. Let me put it even more harshly. And I mean it. If I fail in this requirement, am I saved? Take it home. Wrestle with it. I've been wrestling with it. I'm not going to try to answer because I don't have the answer. But someday, God's going to look at me face to face, eyeball to eyeball, and I'm going to have to be accountable for the way I treated even him. It's just the way it is, right? Amen. When you're offering your gift at the altar, if you remember that your brother or sister has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar and go. First be reconciled with your brother or sister, and then come and offer your gift. There's that word again. A reconciliation. God reconciled the world to himself, not counting our sins against us, giving us grace, giving us life, giving us eternity, and expects us to reciprocate that. That's where the signs say, love God and love your neighbor. That's why when Jesus is asked, what's the greatest commandment? The first one is the Shema that every Jewish young person learned from, from almost from birth. Shema Israel, hear all Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and all your mind and all your being. And Jesus added to that, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. And then the Sermon on the Mount, he says, you can't do one without the other. There's that word again. Reckon, but I don't like everybody. Some people irritate the absolute hell out of me, right? And I'm mad at some people. And I want them to agree with me. But they don't. So what do I do? And how do I, how do I make those relationships that are broken a little bit better? Well, like I said, Scripture is valuable. Scripture has a place, and Scripture also has a suggestion, suggestion and an outline, again from Jesus. If another member of the church sins against you, go and point out the fault when the two of you are alone. If the member listens to you, you have regained that one. But if you are not listened to, take one or two others along with you so that every word may be confirmed by the evidence of two or three witnesses. If the member refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. And if the offender refuses to listen even to the church, let such a one be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. Oh, that sounds like I got a way out, doesn't it? I got three steps, and then I get to push you aside, shun you, and have nothing to do with you. Except there's just one problem with that. The problem with that interpretation is Jesus. He keeps getting in the way of all my preconceptions. He keeps messing with my ideas. Because how did Jesus treat Gentiles and tax collectors? Did he shun them or did he go after them? My, my recollection is that in every case he went after them. It's not a way out. It's a way of reconciliation. At just the right time, while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. While we're still weak. While we can do nothing for ourselves, he died for us so that we could be reconciled to God. And he's given us a ministry of reconciliation. God works through us. So I've asked you to reflect. And boy, that, that can be so incredibly painful. I've reflected on old hurts, ones that I felt like I've experienced, ones that I know I have done to other people. The interesting thing in Jesus' description of how you handle that is it's the person that's wronged who takes the step toward reconciliation. Did you notice that? If another member of the church sins against you, go and point. It doesn't say that that person is supposed to come to you and say, I'm sorry. It's nice when they do. But the steps outlined in Jesus' suggestion are that I, as the person who feels wrong, reach out and make the first step toward reconciliation. Sisters and brothers, the body of Christ relies on our being reconciled to God and it relies on our being reconciled to one another. It's not easy. Nobody said it was easy. I'm always concerned when Christianity turns into bumper sticker theology. It's great to say honk if you love Jesus. But it's a whole lot better to live like you love Jesus and honk your life. You know, sisters and brothers, we have a great opportunity to be the people of God. And we have been equipped. We have been prepared. We can do this. I would suggest that we reflect on what God has done for us. We find
find ways to repent for the times we know we have failed, missed the mark, and that we be reconciled to God, and as such, we be reconciled to one another. Amen. Please join me in singing. To God be the glory. I have committed to you. I'm sure that there are sins of omission and commission. I got a violent temper sometimes, and I get irritated even at him. Uh, not often though, right? We don't get mad. Eh, yeah. <laughs> Do you know what? We need each other. We really and truly need each other. So I know that we're not supposed to be hugging, and that's fine. How about an elbow bump? How about an air hug? How about a way of letting people know that we are the body of Christ? The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and grant you peace now and forevermore. <laughs>